I thought to myself, I painted all my life and I understand color. I need to make some money. What can I do? Gemology. In 1980, I came to Thailand because Thailand, Burma, Myanmar produced the best rubies and sapphires and rare gemstones in the world. If you Google like Bangkok and scam, yeah. one of the scams that's gonna come up is the gem scam. So I started uh, photographing all these uh, tribes that I'd never seen before. Were they killing people for these heads? Or yeah, they yeah, they were killing people for their heads. How's it going folks? Pete here from Tyrish Times. How are you doing? What is the story? I've had to do about five takes because this chair is creaking. It needs a bit of oil. Anyway, I shouldn't have said that now. I should. <laughs> well, we might have to cut that part out. Anyway, I digress. The story is I interviewed an American. His name is Richard Duran and Richard came over here first in 1980. And he came over here in search of rubies and gems. And that search brought Richard from Thailand into Myanmar, deep into the mountains where the terrain is so rugged that neighboring villages have developed completely distinct languages, their own unique style of living, their own customs. We're talking about people that have been isolated from the rest of the world. They'd never seen a Westerner before. We're gonna be talking about headhunters people that went into other villages and cut off the heads of their enemy, took it back and hung it outside their house in their village. It was a trophy. I mean, this is like Indiana Jones type of stuff. Anyway, without further ado, let's go meet Richard. Let's hear the story. And if you like the story, leave me a comment, like the video, subscribe to the channel. And I don't say this enough, but share the video. A little birdie told me that the YouTube algorithm loves when you share it when you share it on Facebook, because you know YouTube likes when they take people from Facebook into YouTube, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, thanks very much, let's get into it. Richard. Hi Pete. How you doing? <laughs> very good, thank you. Thank you very much for doing this. I really My appreciate pleasure. you taking the time for this interview. Great. So tell everybody where you're from. I'm from uh, San Francisco. I was born in San Francisco uh, during the glorious age of rock and roll. So, you know, in those days, in the 60s, every major act in the world came through San Francisco. Jimi Hendrix, Cream, Bo Diddley, and uh, you could see three acts like that in one night. Let's talk about your background, because you okay. told me off camera that you uh, grew up in San Francisco, but yeah. your father, what did your father do? My father was the manager of the Cow Palace, which is, uh, it's a 16,500 seat auditorium. It's the biggest, it was the biggest auditorium in the West Coast. So they had, uh, you know, the first Beatles concert on the West Coast, uh, August 1964, was performed there, Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey Circus. So when the circus came to town, my father would give me to the circus. I was about 10 years old and I'd be a yellow canary, you know, in the circus. So all the trapeze artists, uh, the beautiful girls in their sequence, you know, the midgets, I'd sit down with the midgets, I was their size, and they'd be drinking whiskey and playing poker. You know, it was a pretty amazing upbringing, you know. You met the Beatles when you were yeah, a kid. Yeah, August 1964, it was the first, uh, the show was only 29 minutes long, according to my father's book and uh, it was five dollars and fifty cents. <laughs> wow. And what were they like? Did you talk to them? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, they were with Joan Baez, they were backstage, you know, and it was a pretty raucous uh, get-together. The girl I was with, you know, broke into tears, and so I had to take care of her. She couldn't believe it, you know. I mean, it was amazing, the Beatles, you know. It was amazing. In 1966, my father put on the Rolling Stones, so, I mean, anybody, you know, uh, Pink Floyd, uh, ACDC, uh, the Grateful Dead, who become, you know, very good friends of mine. I mean, everybody played there. 
It was a, it was a huge venue, uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, not by today's standards, but 16,000 seats is a lot of seats. Which uh, artists did you really like? Um, you know, I was talking to a friend yesterday. I saw James Brown in the famous Flames uh, rehearsal. So I was the only person there to watch James Brown. But Ronnie and the Ronettes, she just knocked me out. I met uh, little Stevie Wonder. Wow. He and I are the same age. He was 13, I was 13. And my father introduced me and said, you know, look at this kid, he can play all these instruments. And because he was blind, he couldn't go up the stairs into the dressing room. He had to stay down in the workman's area with all the shovels and all that kind of stuff, you know. The Republican National Convention of 1964. So I met, um, Reagan, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, Nelson Rockefeller. You know, I was selling hot dogs. I sold, uh, oh God, I don't know how many hot dogs, but I had access to the entire area so I could go and meet all these, all these people. I met Cassius Clay before he became Muhammad Ali. Whoa, what yeah. did you say? He's my, he's, I'm a big fan. Man. Yeah, Ali, yeah, it was oh my unbelievable. God. My father introduced me to him, you know. Did, what did you say to him? Oh, just, you know, you know, <laughs> so great to meet you, you know, he was yeah. 63. So um, he just, I guess a few years earlier, won the gold medal at the Olympics. Yeah, yeah. Well, what a sweet, sweet man, you know, just fabulous, you know, so. My father, you know, Bob Hope, I mean, you, you name it, I met all kinds of people. My father taught me never look up to anybody, never look down on anybody, look straight across at everybody. And I've held that in my heart, you know, all my life, you know. It's I a never, way to be. My father always took great pleasure in screwing up people's names. Especially the more famous they were, the more he, you know, botched their name. That's brilliant. Just to bring them back to earth, you know. Yeah. You know, you know. <laughs> but he put on Elvis. I mean, you name it. You know, it was there every every uh, every major act that there was. You know. So Richard, it's. I mean, you've lived like we could be here. I, this could be like a four-hour long yeah, right, um, yeah, interview yeah. here. But we, right. we, that's the problem I have with the with YouTube. You know, it's you gotta keep it to a, a half an hour kind of. <laughs> But anyway, well, let's 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 look past that because sure. I want to get into uh, Thailand. But I also want to get into Myanmar or back in the day Burma, right? Mm -hmm. So when I was on your blog, you described yourself as a gemologist, photographer, adventurer, and painter. Mm -hmm. So tell us, gemologist, what's that all about? Gemology. I went. I'll start, I went to the California Institute of Art, Walt Disney's brainchild. I got a full scholarship to go to uh, the California Institute of Art in 1972. It was the first, it was, they just opened the uh, school. There was only 2,000 students and they had six schools, music, drama. I entered the um, art school because I was a painter, an oil painter. I've been painting since I was 13. And when I graduated from the Disney School, um, I got on one of the president liners, President Wilson, and I sailed um, from San Francisco to Yokohama, Japan. Uh, 16 days at sea in a three-day typhoon. It was unbelievable. I mean, they stretched ropes through the boat, so you had to go down the hallways like this. The, ship was tossing around. You could see the 40-foot propellers on the back of the ship. It was unbelievable. Uh, your cutlery had to be held down with prongs so it wouldn't fly off and into the air. And I got to Japan with a cultural visa, Bunka Koryu. And the job that I thought that I was going to do there, illustrating medical texts, acupuncture, fell through. So I had a cultural visa and I thought, what can I do? Here I am in Japan, you know, it's a one-year visa, renewable. So I decided to study karate. So I studied karate in Japan. I lived in Kyoto, the old capital, it was beautiful, you know, and I made friends with all the uh, cultural people there, the musicians, the poets, the artists and um, studied karate every day, every day, every day. And when I received my black belt, when I earned my black belt, 
um, I returned to the United States. And no one in the United States, my friends, could understand my experience. It was completely alien to them. And so I thought to myself, well, I painted all my life and I understand color. I need to make some money. What can I do? Gemology. Here's where my study of color can make me some money. So I went to the uh, Gemological Institute of America uh, to go to school. And a girl that I had met in Japan kind of, you know, actually she didn't like me too much. <laughs> she was dating a guy in the most popular rock and roll band in Japan at the time, Marahachi Boo. But I met her there and she was 18 years old. I was 21. And when I came back and went to gem school, there she is again. She's one class behind me in gem school. So we kind of dated a little bit, you know, um, but I graduated, I graduated uh, as a graduate gemologist from the Gemological Institute of America. And uh, so I went back to San Francisco uh, to work there. I worked down on Geary Street as the shop gemologist. And one day I'm out on my lunch and uh, looking up at the clouds, I bumped into her again. There's my future wife. So um, I said, you yeah, know, this is really getting silly. So we started dating. And um, so in 19, let's see, 1979, I graduated, 78, I graduated from the GIA. And in 1979 was when I was working in San Francisco. And um, my wife at that time, Junko, was developing a restaurant. It was the first robata style, robata yaki style restaurant in the United States. Very raucous place. A lot of sake, a lot of, you know, uh, cooking the food and fe feeding the people on um, boat paddles. It was great. We had, you know, Ronnie Wood of the Rolling Stones, all kinds of people in there. So I got tired of working in uh, the retail jewelry business as anybody's gemologist. So in 1980, I came to Thailand because Thailand, Burma, Myanmar produced the best rubies and sapphires and rare gemstones in the world. So I wanted to come here and start uh, buying and selling and getting into the business. So in February of 1980, I first came to Thailand and uh, immediately I began to meet the people in the business, in the industry. And because I had a very good sense of color, because in gemstones, if you have a ruby, the slightest variance of color can be thousands of dollars. So if it gradually turns orange or maybe a little brown or purple or pink, the purity of the hue is value. The closest to the purity of red is the highest value. Anything that varies from that will be a lesser value. The same with blue, the same with yellow, green, any color. The purity of color is what's important. And I've studied color all my life. So I was very good at it. <laughs> the rubies I was buying were very popular. And I could come back uh, to, the, to the restaurant in San Francisco and roll one across the table and say, hey, look at that. Woo, look at that, you know, looky, looky. Nice, beautiful Burmese three carat ruby. And at the time they were reasonable. You could, you could buy them. They weren't, you know, the massive prices that they become. Investing in gemstones is a good idea. Were you buying these gems in Thailand or were you going into Myanmar to get them? In the beginning in Thailand, in the beginning in Thailand, the Burmese dealers would come here, dealers from all over the world would come here to sell because Bangkok is the center of the world for colored stones. This is where everybody in the world comes and brings rough stones to be cut and polished. 
around 1981, I started going into Burma. And um, the stones that I was seeing were absolutely un unbelievable, you know, 25 karat red spinels, pieces that you just don't see anymore, 30 karat, you know, pure blue star sapphires. I mean, fantastic material. What kind of money are we talking? You'd buy it for how much and how much would you sell it for? Well, in those days, for instance, you buy something, say, for fifteen, ten thousand dollars You you buy it for 10000 you can sell it for 15000 A 100000 you can sell it for 150 You know, sometimes you get very lucky. I mean, you know, the house that we bought in San Francisco was from one particular Burmese star ruby. Wow, yeah. and you just, when you go in there, you just, you when you when you check it, you know, okay, I'm onto a winner here. Oh, yeah. So it's all it's all on you to find the, the valuable ruby. You're pitting your knowledge. It's the buyer and the seller. It's the buyer and the seller. You're pitting your knowledge against the guy who's selling it to you. And he knows his stones. I mean, you know, the, it, his family may have been generations in the gem business. They know what they're doing exactly. And so you're pitting your knowledge against him. And there's a lot of money you're putting on the table. It's a all cash deal. It's not like I'll write you a check. It's it's money on the table today on the barrel head. And were you carrying cash into Burma? Yeah, sure. How much cash were you carrying? Oh, sometimes a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I bought a stone here in Thailand uh, one time when they didn't have thousand baht notes, they only had 500s, the orange, the uh, purple ones. And I, it was two shopping bags Jeez, of, and of 500 baht notes to buy one stone. And um, were you going in there by yourself or were you going there with some people? Did you hire I some people? I always have people. I always have people on the ground, you know, I always have people in the ground because, uh, you know, sometimes it can get a little sketchy when you're, you know, carrying large sums of money. If you Google like Bangkok and scam, yeah. one of the scams that's gonna come up is the gem scam. Definitely. If someone's coming over to Thailand and they wanna buy gems, how can they avoid getting scammed? The first thing is if you're really interested in uh, purchasing gems here, as I said, Bangkok is the center of the world for colored stones. But in any business at all, anything where there's a lot of money involved, you're gonna have scams. In the art world, there's fake paintings, fake sculptures, fake gemstones, fake anything, fake money. Anywhere where there's a lot of money, you're gonna find fakes. So what I would say is, if you're buying a stone uh, from a reputable dealer, uh, don't accept the certificate from the person that you're buying the stone from. There's very reputable uh, gem laboratories that are internationally recognized. The GIA, Gemological Institute of America, Lotus Gem Labs, uh, SSEF, which is the uh, Swiss Gem Laboratory. There's world-renowned laboratories here who will issue a certificate uh, so that you can make sure that what you're getting is genuine. I think these old time scams where the tuk-tuk driver, you know, at the Emerald Buddha, Temple of the Emerald Buddha takes you to his jewelry store or something like that um, and sells you very cheap quality stones and says, oh, you can go back to your country and double your money. You have to ask yourself, well, then why isn't he doing it? Why isn't he taking his gemstones to whatever country and doubling his money if it was that easy? Obviously it's not. Uh, gemology is a science and uh, you certainly have to be able to understand the science of something to know what you're buying. But it's also an art. You have to understand the color, the purity of color, because color, the purity of color is going to depend on how much per carat you're paying. So I want to move now to another adventure that you had in Burma where you photographed oh. tribes. How that came about, um, I started wanting to go deeper and deeper into the more isolated areas of Burma, into the Shan state, uh, closer to where the mine mining area actually is. And um, 
as I started really venturing out there, you know, into particularly into Shan State, I began to see these people that were not like the tribes people here in, in Thailand. The Miao, the Karen, the, you know, the Lisu, like that. There were, there were people I'd never seen before. And I was fascinated by them, you know, uh, the Tang Yu Lumiu, who wore these brass rings around their, uh, their ankles. And I, I began to really become fascinated, you know, I'm a collector, I'm collector mentality. So I started uh, photographing all these uh, tribes that I'd never seen before. And then I started really doing my research and uh, looking to see, you know, what, what sort of research had been done, what sort of photography had been done on the tribes people over the years. And I <clears throat> ran into a, an author who was a British administrator named Sir George Scott. And he published a five volume series called Burma and the Upper Shan States in 1899-1900 and black and white photographs of some of the tribal people. He went through the language. He, you know, did this for the queen. He was, that was his job to go out in the bush and really um, document all these people. So his book was like my Bible. In 1962, uh, General Ne Win um, made a coup d'etat and took over the country, nationalized everything. So all further study and research on the ethnic minorities stopped. These um, tribes, they hadn't seen Westerners ever before, right, oh, when you went there? Not at all. Back in 1981, when I first started going to Myanmar, Burma, um, there was only a seven-day tourist visa extended. So there wasn't time for anybody to go out into these remote areas to really uh, interface with any of the tribes. So yeah, they'd never seen a white person before. They'd, they'd uh, been essentially isolated and living the life that they had had since um, the time Sir George Scott first encountered them, you know, in 1899, 1900, you know, when he published his uh, uh, books on um, Burma and the Upper Shan states. So, what did they make of you when they saw you? What, did they notice anything different about you? Because did they compare? Like, uh, you look like this, and we are, we look like this. Well, this group of beret girls that I met um, from Karini State, they have the big wheels in their ears, and when I met them, you know, the two girls are laughing and talking to one another, you know, and I asked my friend, you know, who spoke beret. Uh, what are they saying? And you know, he said they think you're, you're you remind them of a prawn because you're pink and all your skin's been burned off. And they were laughing. They'd never seen a white person, a pink person before. Pinky, you know, that was me, <laughs> Pinky. I started really getting into the photography of the tribes because no one had done it. I didn't realize it at the time, you know, but. Uh, as it turned out, I was creating a record of ethnographic culture in Burma that had never been done before. And Pete, because of the time that I was doing it, a lot of the tribes that I was uh, photographing have since, the cultures have since disappeared. The Kaku wearing the big uh, amber earrings, the Lashi who wear three silver cylinders, what unique traditions did they have that are now lost? Oh, well, the, the Wa people, for instance, you know, uh, some one generation before um, would take, take heads, they'd cut off heads and put them, you know, out in their fields for rice crops. What do you mean for rice crops? They, they said that uh, certain heads were good for their rice crops. Uh, for instance, they liked the Punjabi head, the head with the long beard and long hair. That was very good for agriculture. So whose head were they, I mean, were they killing people for these heads? Or yeah, they yeah, they were killing people for their heads. They would invade other villages for these? Yeah, they, they'd invade other villages and take their heads. They were very fierce people. I, I interviewed um, 
on that iBook, the Apple iBook that I have on Burma Richard, you know, the, the blogs. I, I have an interview with uh, Mahasan. Uh, this guy was the Prince of Ving Gun in Wastig. And the interview, I'm asking him, what seasons do you go hunt heads? April and May, you know, which heads are the best for agriculture? You know, like that. And were you this scared that they might cut your head off like a white the, guy's head? The end of the interview, I'm saying, well, you wouldn't take my head, would you? You know, it was, it was a joke, but I mean, I was there. I was there with the Revolutionary Council of Rebel Leaders. So, I mean, it was a great time to interview him. Also, the Naga people, the Naga people were headhunters. Uh, when I was invited by the Naga Revolutionary Council in 1996 to go uh, experience their Naga New Year, it was unbelievable. There were maybe two or three other foreigners that were there. And uh, all these Naga came in from over the hills, you know, yelling with their ox, you know, uh, ox hide shields and spears. And I was out there watching them people coming over the hills like ants. It was unbelievable. It was like, you know, 100 years ago or something like that, you know? They sacrificed a bull and I mean, it was, Incredible. I brought some uh, Lefroy single malt scotch up there, about three liters, and their cognac, you know, their, their uh, fermented rice wine. We had an unbelievable time, you know, and um, yeah, they are no longer taking heads, but the cognac naga, you know, nobody's sure. You get back into the hills some distance, you know, stuff happens, you know. You had Nobel uh, Peace Prize Lorette. Aung San Suu Kyi open your exhibition. So you yes. took photos and they were they were in an exhibition yes. in, in Myanmar and she came to it. In 1997, 1997, I'd photographed more than 40 separate tribes in Burma. It's the, the largest single collection of uh, ethnographic photography, Burmese ethnographic photography in the world. So said Asia Week magazine. So um, a dear friend of mine put me in touch with this publishing house in London called Weidenfeld Nicholson. Um, and they published my book called The Vanishing Tribes of Burma. And it was launched at the United Nations in London for the decade of the world's indigenous people. It was quite big, it was quite cool. Um, it was republished in Paris by Grund and in uh, the United States in, in New York by Amphoto. So I met these folks that were very wealthy philanthropists who wanted to put on um, a photography exhibition in Burma. And it was during a brief window of opportunity where Burma experienced freedom. And Aung San Suu Kyi was the leader of the country. She had won the Nobel Peace Prize. And I contacted her and asked her, you know, uh, would you open my exhibition? I mean, this is not something she does, you know. She's not, she doesn't attend these kinds of things. I mean, the, you know, the military there had tried to assassinate her already once, you know, so we had to be very wary. And she came and um, opened the exhibition and gave a beautiful speech. Um, she said, and I want to thank Mr. Richard Durand for bringing beauty into my life when I least expected it. That's when she was under house arrest. Um, at the end of the 2013 exhibition in Rangoon, Yangon, um, we donated all 70 photographs to the National Museum. And they're hanging there today on, uh, you know, permanent display in the ethnographic section of the National Museum in Rangoon. So, quite cool. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, really, really cool. Yeah. So, I mean, I suppose we we have to talk about your life in Bangkok as well. Yeah. So, tell us about your life in Bangkok. Do you enjoy living over here? What are your hobbies? Yeah, I enjoy living in Asia. It just it agrees with me, you know, very much. I'm I'm um, 
I'm still painting, you know, from about 2002. I picked up my paintbrushes again and really began to uh, paint. So are you in Bangkok now for good? You're in here for a long haul yeah. in Thailand. Yeah, I love living in Thailand. You know, this, this uh, country is um, very good. I, I, like, I like Thai people. I like uh, Thai food. I like, you know, Bangkok is an international city. There's every kind of food. You want the greatest Italian food, French food, the greatest wine. It's an international city. There's people coming in from everywhere. And uh, because of that, there's a lot of interesting characters here. You can meet people from all over the world. People coming in from Kenya, from Mozambique, from uh, Finland, you know. It's, there's people that you can sit down and talk with and really get their story, learn something about their life. Yeah, there's no greater teacher than uh, traveling. And Thailand is really... Yeah, I mean, this this place had, what, 20 million people before the COVID, you know? You, you mentioned that off camera, you said that traveling is a great teacher. Yeah. Can you tell, elaborate more on that? What has traveling done for you? You can go to school, you can get a PhD in, you know, 18th century French literature, but it doesn't really enrich your life. I mean, unless you meet somebody else with the same background travel you meet people with backgrounds that have nothing to do with your life and this is the way you, that, you, that your eyes are open you say, oh my look at what this person is doing look at this person's background travel is the greatest teacher in the world and i would suggest it to, to everybody go do it when i was 16 years old a friend of mine that was 15 and didn't even have his driver's license um, wrote to the Ecuadorian government. We wanted to go to the Galapagos Islands. This is 1966. Nobody was going to the Galapagos Islands. And they wrote us back and they said, sure, hey, welcome, you know. And our parents caught wind of this and they said, hey, no way, you know, this boat, the Cristobal Colombo, was gonna drop us off on an island, the Galapagos Islands, and come back a month later to pick us up. Our parents said, no, this isn't gonna happen. So they bribed us. My friend was rich. I worked for my money. I popped popcorn, you know, at sporting events for a dollar twenty-five cents an hour. We bought a car for two hundred bucks, and we drove from San Francisco to Guatemala and back. When you were sixteen. Sixteen, yeah. <laughs> and uh, my father put on the Mexican charros. They're like. Uh, Mexican cowboys, you know, with honor and the silver and the hats. And they, my father was able to get all their horses across the border and everything. It was a different time. And uh, they loved my father, you know, he, you know, the Charles performed in front of 16,000 people, you know, twice a day, the night show and the matinee. And uh, Senor Antonio Hill Ortega loved my father. So, you know, he said, well, your son comes through Mexico City, have him stop by. So we did. And he gave us two uh, pearl-handled Smith & Wesson chrome-plated 38 caliber pistols with hundreds of rounds of ammunition, you know. So here you are at 16, driving yeah. through Mexico. Yeah. With guns and ammo. Yeah. <laughs> in Oaxaca, they, they stopped us and they, you know, they found the guns and the ammunition. So we had to give them only the bullets, the six bullets that were in the gun. And we paid a hundred peso fine. It was eight dollars at the time. And they gave us our guns back. But you could keep the other ammo. Yeah. Yeah, it was only the ones <laughs> in the chambers, you know. And we, we there was a typhoon in Puerto Escondido, those days, you know, there was no paved road, it was all dirt road. We had to have our car, our Ford Woody, pulled across uh, the Rio Grande River, the Rio Verde and the Rio Grande. We got stuck in between. We had a truck pull our car over, so we were in between the rivers, got hit with a, you know, a hurricane. I mean, we, we shot birds and skewered them on our car antenna to live, you know, I got deathly sick, you know, it's unbelievable. And then when I was 18, I traveled through the Iron Curtain. I went through Checkpoint Charlie, 
in the east uh, Germany, you know, and the border guard insisted he stopped the car and insisted the guy drive me to Poland. He was going to Poland anyway, you know, but unbelievable. The guard posts, you know, in the forest, you know, these guys in a communist uh, East Germany with aluminum money. And I went to Poland. Uh, there were still pieces of building laying in the street that had been blown off from, you know, the World War II. Hungary, you know, the revolution of 56, there were bullet holes in the walls. Uh, Czechoslovakia, I could get a Pilsner or a Kell beer and a Cuban cigar for a nickel. I gave away Kennedy half dollars, silver half dollars. I met people with the tattoos that had been in Auschwitz and they told me their story. A guy, Felix Zedler, I'll never forget, took me, you know, to, you know, go show me the concentration camp. This is camp. in Hungary. This, is, this was in uh, Poland. And he took you to the concentration yeah, camp? Yeah. What was that like? That was 1967. It was horrifying. It was horrifying for anybody that doesn't believe that happened. It happened. It definitely happened. I met, oh, I met a lot of people on the trains, you know, because you get the Eurail pass. You could travel, travel everywhere, you know. And uh, yeah, the, the tattoos, A with the, with the number, they were from Auschwitz. Survivors, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, Tito was still in power. You know, I mean, France, de Gaulle was still president. He lived in a remarkable life. Yeah, you need it, to write a book about it. I have, actually. I have. You have? Yeah, but there's a lot of parts of it that uh, I'm thinking of more in terms of doing a movie, because then it can be fictionalized. I mean, there's a lot of parts of it that, you know, I, I, I'd be reluctant to put into print. Yeah. Just put it like that, you know. They were, yeah. I don't want to get well, into Richard, those stories. We'll leave it there. It's All right, Pete. Absolute, absolute. You're a legend. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> what a life of adventure. Yes. Really excellent stuff. Yeah. And what I'll do is I'll link your media. I'll link the book in the description. I'll link your blog as well, so people can read your blog because that's Wonderful. a really great read. Thank so you. Check out the blog. It's where I got a lot of the stuff for this interview today. Thank you. So anyway, folks, thank you very much for watching. Hit the like button leave us a comment and share the video. Share it on your Facebook or share it with a friend. Uh, little Birdie told me that sharing is actually really important <laughs> on YouTube. Yeah, it helps the channel grow and Absolutely. the algorithm and all that. So thanks very much. I'll see you on the next one. Cheers. Thank you.